Good morning, everyone. Today is Sunday, 16th February 2020. Our reading will come from the Epistle of Paul to the Romans. The Epistle of Paul to the Romans, chapter 5. We shall read verse 12, and then we shall jump to verse 18 and read it to the end, verse 21. So Romans 5, 12, then 18 to 21. And it reads, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because, of, because all sinned, Therefore, as through one man's offense, verse 18, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous, righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, we come to you by the power of your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Lord, on our own, we can do nothing. By ourselves, we can read and we will never understand. So we welcome you, the spirit of truth, spirit of revelation, that you would come and Open up the word to us. Reveal the word to us. Show us what you need us to hear and know and live by today. We commit our hearts unto you. Open the eyes of our hearts. Open the ears of our understanding. And help us to, to receive what we are hearing. The seed that you are going to plant in us. We pray that that seed may germinate and, and grow and yield abundant fruit for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Okay. So um, the title of our message today will be How Sin Came In. How Sin Came In. Or How Sin Entered the World. How did sin come into the world? How did sin come to be? We are treating the subject, how sin entered the world. Amen? Okay. Verse 12 of that Romans 5 says, Therefore, when you, hear, when you read a therefore, that means something happened before. Something happened and happened and happened Therefore, that and that now happens. So therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world. That's how sin entered the world, through one man. Sin entered the world through one man. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, so death the, the, the cause of death is sin. And death through sin, so there will be no death without sin. So sin entered the world, and death came also into the world through sin. And thus, death spread to all men because now all have sinned. Sin entered through one man, bringing death, and it spread to everyone because through that one man, every other human being has sinned. And that you can read from day one, Genesis chapter two. 
Genesis 2, verse 17. Genesis 2, verse 17, right? At the beginning, before sin came, God had warned the one man that we are talking about today, Adam, the father of all human beings. That's the physical father, the earthly father. So, Genesis 2, verse 17, God is talking to, okay, let's read from, from verse 15 so that it makes sense. Genesis 2, 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. That was his assignment. Tend the garden, keep it. Cultivate it, take care of it. That was his assignment. The garden was there before he came. God put him there in that beautiful garden to cultivate it and take care of it. Verse 16 of Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, commanded, it was a command. That means there's, there's a, 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 a situation, there's a commandment, there's a, a regulation, a stipulation. The Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But, verse 17 that we are going to, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, so he knew it ahead of time. God did not put a trap for him to fall in. God made the situation completely clear. You can eat everything, live in this garden, cultivate it, enjoy it, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. I give you all good. This one is both good and evil. So don't touch it. Just enjoy the good. You see, right from the beginning. God is not partial. God is not evil. Of the tree, because see, God is God. He knows good and evil, but he doesn't do evil. But he tells you don't do evil. Don't, don't seek evil. Just enjoy the good. Of the tree of the knowledge, because when you eat it, then you will go into a different realm, a different knowledge. You will know something you are, you are not supposed to know. Don't eat it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely, surely die. It wasn't a maybe. It wasn't a could be. It was a surely. You will definitely die if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. So we know that God did not hide anything from a human being, from, from Adam, as it were, from their one. But as it happened, deception came into the world. Deception came to them through the serpent. And they had the choice to say, no, nope, serpent, we won't listen to you. Because we have been pre-warned. We have been forewarned. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. We know the, the consequence of eating of this tree. So we will not eat it. But they did not think it through. They allowed the serpent to deceive them. And they took of the tree and they ate. And once they ate it, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. 
Once they ate it, death and curse came into the world. So sin gave birth to death, it just as God said it. And if you read uh, verse 17 of chapter 3 of Genesis, God cursed the ground for Adam's sake. God wasn't wicked to curse the ground. It was a result of Adam's disobedience. Genesis 3 verse 17. Then to Adam, God said, because you have heeded, you see, they said because. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you. It was a command. I commanded you saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. See, when we read the Bible, we should look at those words we seem to overlook. God did not just come from nowhere and place a curse on, on, on the earth. No, it was because, as a result of disobedience. In toil, since you want to know good and evil, now let's go play good and evil game. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you. Because that's what you chose. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are. And to dust you shall return. Simple. So death set in. Sin came in, and death came as a result of sin, the sin of disobedience, sin of not listening to the command that our loving Father had given to you. He didn't say, God didn't say, oh, you could or you could not, or maybe, or God said it's a command. I commanded you. I gave you everything that is good. And I told you, that one is not that good. So don't touch it. And because of that, if you read further, verse 22 of, of that chapter 3, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. I only wanted him to know good, but now he also knows evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life. The first tree of, was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the second tree is the tree of life. Lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever in that sinful state. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So God drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned everywhere to guard the way to the tree of life. So even this, Genesis 3, 22 to 24, is an act of love. It's an act of love because, okay, let's go backwards a bit. Because uh, we just read um, Genesis 3 up to the curse, that unto dust you shall return. And then verse 21 says, also for Adam and his wife, listen to this. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics, tunics of skin and clothed them. Tell, just tell me that it's not the love of God. You could have said, okay, you are clever now, and you went and sewed fig leaves for yourself. Then wear fig leaves. Tomorrow they'll dry out in the sun. You go and sew another one. 
The next day it will dry and brittle. You go and sow another one. But in God's indescribable love, God showed them a permanent skin to cover them. Tunics of skin and clothe them. God should have been angry. You disobeyed me. Then go, go, go find out how you deal with yourself. And then he could have allowed them to eat of the tree of life and, and live like that, you know, sinful, you know, and, and, and remove from his presence forever. You see, when people keep asking about God's love, it's because they don't know what the word is saying. If only we would read the Bible and listen to it. This is Genesis. We've not passed chapter 3 yet. Full of God's love. To a man that has disobeyed him. We only want to see the bad which we caused for ourselves. But we forget the love that God still loved us even when we disobeyed. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died. God had to slaughter an animal and make tunics of skin to clothe a man that had just disobeyed him and prevented him from living that sinful life forever by blocking the tree of life. Because that would have been the end. Adam would have burned in hell forever. But God's love goes beyond our sin. God's love goes beyond our mistakes. God's love goes beyond what we can think of or imagine. Never let Satan deceive you that because you have, you have just made a mistake that you are going to hell immediately. As long as you still have a conscience and you regret and repent and run back to God. God's love is greater than our sin. Let's go back to Romans. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death came through as a result of that sin and thus death spread to all men. So people, stop asking yourself why bad things are happening to you. You inherited it. Death spread to all men. Because now all have sinned. It's in your bloodline. You inherited that sinful nature. But if we read further down, if we read verse 15 of Romans 5, he says, but the free gift is not like the offense. The free gift is not like the offense. God's love is bigger than your sin. The free gift is free. God could have just allowed Adam and Eve to die in sin. But he's too kind, too loving for that. The free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Many died because of one man's sin. But the grace and the gift of God abounds much more. God doesn't sit down and count your little. 
Psalm 130 says, if, if thou, O Lord, will count our, our iniquities, who would stand? Psalm 130. People don't read the word. They keep on beating themselves. Stop beating yourself. Start living for Jesus. It is his gift of love. Then in verse 15 of Romans 5. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Verse 16, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift, free gift, free gift, which came from many offenses, resulted in justification. Love is kind. Love is pure. It's because we don't love. That's why we can't understand God's love. If we would love like God, then we will be easy. We'll be quick to, to, to pardon offenses, just like God did. His free gift, which came from many offenses, resulted now in justification. Verse 17. For if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more. Paul keeps saying much more. Don't settle for that nonsense you've done. If, if you have any amount of regret, that means you are answering the call of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit wants to reveal the, the abounding love of Christ to you. Don't let Satan come the second time and steal from you what Jesus has already paid for. He deceived Adam and Eve the first time. Don't let him deceive you. For if by one man's offense, death ran through the one, much more, much more, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one man, also Christ Jesus. Sin and death came through one man. Justification and righteousness also come through one man. You cannot help yourself, it's a gift. He says the, the abundance of, he says, uh, to those who receive, to those who receive, just open your hand, your heart, and receive Jesus. Let him abolish that which Adam had done. It's just acceptance, not what you do. You just have to receive that grace, that gift of righteousness. One man caused death, and only one man can eliminate death. Not, not our beating ourselves up. Verse 18, Romans 5. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, listen, one man's offense caused judgment to, to, to come to all men. Remember our title, How Sin Came? Through one man. As through one man, one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men. 
no exception, resulting in justification of life. Not what you did, not what I did. A free gift. Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience. Can you, can you guys see how Paul is stressing this thing so that we get it? The Bible doesn't repeat itself because it doesn't have something to say. This is vital. He keeps saying it again and again. Wash your mind off the lies of Satan. Just embrace Jesus. No, not a million people will save you. Sin came through one man, and salvation comes through one man, full stop. Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, Many were made, made sinners. You did not sin. You were made a sinner. Shall I say that again? It's written there, verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Just by receiving the gift of righteousness. You did not sin. You were born into it. You were made a sinner by birth. In the flesh. And the moment you accept the life of the spirit. Through Jesus. You are made righteous. You cannot do anything for it. Apart from receive it. Verse 20. Moreover. The law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, much more. Where we sinned, God's love covered it a million times over. Where sin abounded, grace, the free gift of God, abounded much more. I said it before. God's love is more than your sin. It's bigger than your sin. Just accept Jesus and forget about your sin. You did not sin. You were made a sinner by natural birth. So once you accept the rebirth in the Holy Spirit, you are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 21 of Romans 5. So that as sin reigned in death, even so, even so, so on the contrary, the opposite of that, even so, grace might reign through righteousness. How far? To eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not through your giving, not through your tight, not through your your. You're, you're being kind to the stranger. That only comes because you know that your life is a gift. And now because you walk in love, you extend that love to others.
Let's go back to verse 8 of Romans 5. I've been treating it from 12 down. Now let's go backward because we read in verse 12. Verse 12 started with therefore. So let us go back and see what that there is for. Verse 8. Because I've, I've talked about Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. Yeah, How man, God told man, the day you eat, you shall surely die. So there was an agreement that there will be penalty for disobedience. And even in that disobedience, God was still merciful to them. As we have already talked about. And that's why verse 8 of Romans 5 says, it's teaching us how, what, who God is. He says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us. Listen to this. In that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God demonstrates his love. We read in Genesis how he made a, 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 a clothing of, of, of tunic, of skin. That, that's how God slaughtered the first sacrifice to cover Adam and Eve's sin, temporary. While spiritually, at the same time, Jesus had already died. That is how God demonstrates his love. Let us read that. Uh, uh, Romans 5, 8 again. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. Remember how many times we've, we've, we've gone ahead and, and seen how many times uh, Paul is stressing the grace, the grace, the grace, the gift, the gift, the gift. And so God demonstrated his own love, his kind of love towards us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still wallowing in sin, while we had no knowledge of, or, or no, no scope of, of, of uh, uh, redemption, Christ already died. So why are you killing yourself all over? Why are you not teaching love, showing love, walking in love, recognizing and acknowledging that for whatever sin we committed or our forefathers committed, that Jesus had already died for them. This is the only thing that will bring liberation to the, to the, to the church, to the, to the Christians. Because people go to church, they just sing and dance and go home and beat themselves up. And they live a wrong kind of life because they don't understand the love of God. They, they live a religious life instead of living the life in Christ, being the living Jesus. This is how God demonstrates his love towards us. The, the love that our little minds cannot conceive. Because God can do abundantly, exceedingly, far more. Paul has said, how much more? How much more? We have to, to stop thinking with our limited brain when we think of God. This is how God demonstrated his love towards all sinners. Towards all those who disobeyed him. His immaculate love. His incomprehensible love. In that while, while you were still a sinner. While you were still part of your earthly father's bloodline. Christ died. All you need to do is step out and receive. 
cross over and receive. Jesus told Nicodemus, don't, don't, don't be puzzled that I tell you you must be born again. Just step over from one life to another. That's all you need to do. One man calls sin for everybody. And only one man can wipe away the sin for all men as well. It's like for like. And the one man here, his love is much, much more than we can think of. And until people start to understand the love of God, they still they keep allowing Satan to, to tell them lies. Oh, you are a sinner. You will never go to heaven. And they say, oh, poor me. Poor me, I'm going to hell. Why? That means you choose to. People who go to hell choose to go there. God's love is bigger than our sin. God doesn't want you to go to hell. Verse 9, Romans 5. I love how Paul keeps saying much more. Much more. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. Verse 8, Christ died for us. Verse 9, we receive that sacrifice and we are justified by his blood. Just as if we have never sinned. Much more than, verse 9, having now been justified by his blood, not by your works, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We can only be exempt from God's wrath when we accept the death of Jesus on our behalf. So you know, as you know, as you know, I should have hung on that cross, but Jesus took me off and he hung there on my behalf. So now I am Jesus because Jesus has died my death. I am pure. I am righteous. I am holy because I accept what Jesus just did for me. That's the only way we can be justified, only by his blood. And then we will be saved from the wrath, from the penalty of sin. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Ha, listen to that. Much more. Much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So he died your death, and now you have to live his life. Don't, don't live your life. Live his life. A holy life, a perfect life, a righteous life, covered in his blood, exempt, justified. And not only that, Paul is stressing and stressing and stressing with much more and much more and much more. And he's saying, yeah, I've talked about much more, but not only that, there's more to come. You cannot e e exhaust this love. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received, received the reconciliation, the, the exchange, the exchange. He should have, we should have hung on the cross, but he exchanged it. So now we are righteous, and he nailed our sin to that cross. The enemy doesn't understand that, but you should. When the enemy comes to accuse you of sin, tell him 
My sin has been nailed to the cross. I cannot sin because I live in Christ. I choose to live in Christ. Christ cannot sin, so I do not sin. I know that will scatter some people's brain who are religious. It's written there. Go back and read Romans 5. I did not, Victoria did not say it. The Bible says so. If we go to Ephesians 2, let's just go to Ephesians so that we see the different places that Paul is trying to release this message to the body of Christ. Stop beating yourselves up. Ephesians 2, I read from verse 1 to 10, quickly, because time is running out. But we need to get it. And you, he made, he made alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sin. In which you once walked according to the causes of this world. That means you had listened to the lies of the enemy before. But that was not the truth of the word of God. You, 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 you were dead in trespasses and sin. In which you once walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. So it's the lie of Satan. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So unless you choose to be disobedient, that's how you, you remain a sinner. Among whom, verse 3, Ephesians 2, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. That's before we knew this truth of today. We also conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were, we were thinking that God is like us. And we're by nature children of wrath. When you think like that, you subject yourself to wrath, to punishment, to condemnation. Just as the others who don't know the truth that you know. Verse 4. But again. But God. Ephesians 2 verse 4. Listen to this. But God irrespective, irrespective of your sin. Of, of the fault. Of, of the rubbish. Whatever. But God who is rich in mercy. Because of his great love, which, with which he loved us. I don't know how. This is what we need to tell people. Don't beat yourself up. God is not at your level. Just learn to, to ask God, how, how can I tap into your love? God is rich in mercy beyond your imagination. His love for you is bigger than your sin. I'm still saying it because Paul is saying the same. By revelation. God, who is rich in mercy... Because, why is he so rich in mercy? Why is he so merciful and gracious? Because of his great love. With which he loved, past tense, us. He loved you before you even knew what sin was. Even when we were dead in trespasses, verse 5, 
Ephesians 2. He, he made us alive together with Christ. And he says there in bracket, by grace you have been saved. Verse 6. And raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in, in, in Christ. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are one, intertwined. When you accept Jesus, you become part of that. The carnal mind will not hear what I'm saying now. <laughs> we are seated in Christ. It is not your ability. It's a gift. So once you accept it, you start walking in it. God forgave us because he is so abounding in love and mercy and raised us up together, together with Christ. After Jesus died on that cross for you, he raised us up with him to sit together with him in the heavenly places, in him. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. Exceeding riches of his grace. Stop limiting God's grace in your life. Stop limiting God's mercy in your life. Stop limiting God's love in your life. He loves you more than you can think or imagine. Verse 8, Ephesians 2. Paul is repeating again. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith. That means by just you accepting it. You have faith in Christ. You accept what I'm saying, you accept what the Bible is saying, and the deed is done. And that, not of yourself, Paul is saying again, it is a gift of God. Don't say you did anything for it. It's a gift, handed out, and you accept. You can choose not to accept. Nobody forces anybody to accept a gift. It's just handed out to you. And all you need to do is to hand, hand out your hand, bring out your hand and accept it. Paul is saying that not of yourself. It's a gift. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So that you don't go and boast, oh, I did this, I fasted, I prayed, I, I go to church, I, I give alms, I, I, I pay my tithe. No, no, none of that. People still pay tight in the flesh and think that they are doing something good for God. It's rubbish. Learn to accept this mystery. Ask the Holy Spirit to make it clear to you in your heart. Don't go and boast that you did anything for God. You did not. He did it for you. And why did he do it for us? For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ. For good works. That's why God created you. That's why Satan could never come and spoil God's plan for you. His lack of knowledge. Read there. Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship. He perfected us. He molded us. He designed us. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. God doesn't look at you and say, oh, that one is going to do bad. Because he knows what he created you for. For good works. Once you are in Christ. Which God prepared beforehand. I'm reading, it's not my word. Go read your own Bible. You were created for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God has laid down a path for you. 
to walk in your destiny, your purpose, your life, your career, your everything. If you deviate and do something else and get frustrated, that's not God's plan for you. All you need to do is to come back to the plan. When Satan is whispering nonsense in your ears, remember to speak out to yourself and to him, no, Jesus loved me. He already died for me. I'm already saved. I'm a child of God. Satan, you cannot steal from me. You have to know it and say it and speak it. Agree with it. First Corinthians, we'll close with that one. First Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. First Corinthians 15, I'll be quick about that. First Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. As simple as that. Since by man came death into the world. Remember our, the title of our message, How Sin Came? For since by man came death, by man. So the first man is a small m. The second man is a capital M. By man also came the resurrection of the death. For as in Adam all die, even so. In Christ, all shall be made alive. Made alive. That means once you accept it. You are made just as if you have never sinned. And that's what people need to know so that Satan can stop lying to them. And that's why Galatians... Galatians 2, verse 20, says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. So forget yourself and start living Christ. Start being the living Jesus in the world. Understand that the crucifixion of Jesus was your crucifixion. And so you are dead, but now alive in Christ. So it is the life of Christ you are living, not your life. Don't let Satan tell you about your life. Listen to Paul, to the Galatians. For I, Paul is saying, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In this mortal body is Christ living in me. And the life which I now live in this particular flesh that you are seeing, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We have to understand that exchange. For... Verse, verse 21, so, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. But we all know that Christ did not die in vain. Christ, Christ is alive. You died. Jesus never died. He died your death. And because he lives, you live his life. And that's why 1 Corinthians 13, this is the very, very last. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 18 says, After all we have heard today, everything we've deliberated on, and now abide, faith, hope, love, these three, 
but the greatest of this is love. So start to live a life of faith in Christ. Not your faith, his faith. Because the life I now live in Galatians, I live through faith. I live by faith in, in the Son of God. Galatians 2 verse 20. I've been crucified. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So that's why now faith, hope, and love alone abide. And the greatest of them is love. And our last word for today is start living the life of faith in Christ Jesus. Don't tell yourself, how am I going to do it? Just let Jesus do it through you. Live a life of hope, knowing that you are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That is your hope. That whatever you do in this world, you do it because you know this is not your home. Eventually, you land where your daddy is. Where your father's house is, that's where your house is. So if you have accepted Jesus, where he is, that's where you will be. That's the hope that does not disappoint. Faith in Christ, hope of eternal life, and love in Christ Jesus. And the greatest of this is love. Because all we've heard today is how God loved us, irrespective of our sin. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, we come to you by the power of your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Lord, words, no vocabulary, no language can really, really explain your love for us. And so I pray, sweet Holy Spirit, that it would please you to dig deep into our hearts as we surrender our hearts to you. Make this revelation plain to us. Make this mystery real to us. Help us to see Jesus in whatever we do and wherever we go or whoever we meet. Help us, Lord, by the reason of your instructions to us today, by the reason of your revelation, the revelation of your love to us today, may we live a Christ-like life and know that we are dead to sin and alive in Christ. Blessed be your most holy name. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen.